Hello, welcome to Inside the Alzheimer's Lab. I'm David Shank, author of The Forgetting and Senior Advisor to Cure Alzheimer's Fund, a nonprofit consortium that brings you this program several times a year. Today we're going to be talking with Dr. Roberto Malino, an expert on how memories are formed and stored, and what he's learned about Alzheimer's disease in his research. And we'll be taking your questions. Please submit them to our Facebook page at facebook.com slash curealzheimers. Dr. Roberto Malino, MD, PhD, holds the Shiley Chair in Alzheimer's Disease Research at the University of California at San Diego and is a member of the Cure Alzheimer's Fund Research Consortium. Dr. Malino, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Um, before we get into the research, tell us a little bit about yourself, how you got involved in scientific research, and then how you got involved in Alzheimer's disease research in particular. Sure. Um, when I was in college, I actually studied math and uh, very little biology, but um, through one way or another, I ended up in medical school, and while in medical school, I heard uh, one lecture by this professor, uh, he was talking about synapses and it was fascinating to me. Um, so from that one lecture I would say is how I got hooked onto uh, the study of neuroscience and in particular the study of synapses. So that's uh, pretty much how I got into neuroscience and then uh, I studied synapses and memory for a number of years and then I met a few people who are at the, on the Cure Alzheimer's Cure Alzheimer's Foundation uh, Consortium, uh, Sam Sisodia and Rudy Tanzi, and uh, we started talking about relations between what I did and what they did, and uh, I saw some things that uh, were in common and that we might be able to address with the kinds of techniques that we had been developing. So that's pretty much how I got into the Alzheimer's field. Terrific. And how much of your time would you say is devoted specifically to Alzheimer's research and how much is more towards general research that can be applied elsewhere? Um, I'd say that it's about, well, officially 30 percent of my lab is funded by uh, Alzheimer's um, uh, related money. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, about 30 percent. There are other projects going on that are deal with more basic uh, questions of learning and memory. And uh, there's another part of the lab that lead, uh, deals with uh, major depression. So that's what my lab does. So we, you brought some slides for us today, and you're going to uh, give us a, a short presentation about your work uh, in general and how it relates to Alzheimer's disease. And then you and I will talk a little bit about that. I'm sure I'll have lots of questions. Um, and then we'll, in the end, we'll be, as I said, taking some questions from, from the public. So. Uh, let's, if you're ready, let's move on to your, uh, your slides and your presentation. Sure. Uh, you can ask questions during the slides also. Um, I'll just be talking, but um, sure, we can go through the slides. And um, so uh, is the slide showing now? I, that... I don't think it is. Uh, apparently it is. Um, <laughs> Okay. I can, I can see it. Can you see it? Okay. I can see it in a yeah, in a little window here. Um, so that's okay. You you can probably make it bigger on your screen. Um, yeah, I think so actually. There. Okay. Um, so um, this slide is really showing uh, an image of uh, the activity in a normal human brain. And uh, this is just a, a section of it, and you can see that there's uh, normal activity by the, all the regions that are in red. And so this is a person who is uh, actively using their brain. And, uh, um, and I like to put that quotation there uh, from a fellow South American that uh, I think rings true to a number of people, that uh, life is not what one lived, but what one remembers. And uh, certain parts of your uh, Later in your life, that's uh, many times how you feel, I think. But um, if we now go to the next slide, 
Um, we see, unfortunately, um, what happens to people who have Alzheimer's disease. And so if you take an image of the brain of a person with Alzheimer's disease, this is what you see. And you can see that there's a lot more um, blue areas indicating uh, less brain activity. And basically, there's just uh, significantly less uh, brain activity. And as everybody knows, uh, with Alzheimer's disease, there's uh, in particular and particularly, there's a loss of uh, memory. So that's um, where we come in. Our interest in, over the years has been to study uh, memory. So in the next slide, um, just starts uh, memory. And then the next slide shows uh, our, the uh, basic question of uh, how is it that memory is formed and stored? And uh, then related to Alzheimer's disease would be uh, how is it that uh, memories are removed and or how is it uh, become so that you can no longer make memories? So those are the kinds of questions that we ask um, in the lab. So uh, if we go to the next slide, I'll start telling you a little bit of what we study are really synapses. Synapses uh, are the way that neurons or nerve cells in the brain communicate. And so in this uh, slide, you see a diagram of a piece of a brain. Um, and it's a pretty small piece. Uh, and the next slide shows you the uh, size um, of the human hair. So you can see that uh, this, that's the thickness of uh, human hair. So these are uh, nerve cells that are indicated by uh, neuron 1, neuron 2, neuron 3. These are three different nerve cells. And uh, this part of the brain would be full of uh, nerve cells, but uh, we've only drawn in uh, a few of them so that you can see uh, the different parts. So uh, how is it that nerve cells communicate? Well, you can see neuron 1 sends out uh, a, a process that's called uh, an axon, and uh, that can conduct uh, an electrical signal that uh, travels from neuron one down the axon and gets uh, very close to the dendrite, which is indicated there, of neuron two. And uh, right at the place where they meet is a a uh, site called a synapse, which uh, is shown in the next slide. It's a blow up of that region where the connection between the axon and uh, the dendrite. In the next slide, please. So there's the, um, the uh, on the left is the axon, and it has uh, a little uh, growth there. And those little circles inside there is where neurotransmitter is uh, contained. Um, and uh, on the right side is uh, a little outcropping from a dendrite, and that's the receiving side of the uh, information. So as I mentioned, there's uh, an electrical signal that goes down the axon, and then when it reaches this uh, region filled with those uh, circles, it causes a neurotransmitter to be released uh, into that space between the axon and the dendrite. And uh, the neurotransmitter then uh, touches um, receptors on the dendrite and uh, causes an electrical signal to be formed in the dendrite, so that uh, which can then be transmitted down to neuron 2. Because the dendrite is part of neuron 2. So this is how. Uh, information is transmitted through a synapse. And we know a lot, uh, many individuals, um, some are marked here, have studied uh, synapses for many years. And it's uh, because synapses, turns out, um, are where, for instance, many drugs act. And it's also, uh, it seems to be one of the first sites that is hit in Alzheimer's disease. Now, with respect to memory, we know that synapses come in lots of different uh, strengths. In other words, 
In other words, when a signal comes down the axon, uh, in some synapses, you have uh, a big signal uh, going uh, to the receiving cell, and in some synapses, you have a small signal going from the axon to the dendrite. Um, and what's even more interesting is that the strength or the level of communication between the axon and the dendrite through the synapse can be changed um, through different by different conditions. So that's uh, those are the basic elements of uh, of a synapse. And uh, so let's talk a little bit about uh, what this has to do with memory. So in the uh, next slide, um, we're going to talk about basic uh, one form of memory that I think uh, a lot of people will uh, be able to remember is uh, when you have a, a, a rat in a cage and it's running around and if you uh, expose it to a tone, uh, normally that has no effect. The rat will continue moving around normally. But if you now uh, give a tone at the same time as a shock, that's in the next slide, indicated by uh, the uh, little uh, thunderbolt, so that's a shock and the tone being given at the same time for a brief period. Uh, subsequently, um, in the next slide, if we uh, now just expose the rat to a tone, um, it will freeze. It uh, remembers that uh, it got the shock last time, and uh, the last time it had a tone, and so it remembers that uh, the tone meant that there was a shock coming. And so that's an indication of memory. Um, and we can measure that very carefully by looking to see how, how much the, uh, the animal shows fear, for instance, by freezing. Rats show fear by freezing. So what do synapses have to do with uh, this form of memory? And so what I'm going to do is uh, uh, show you how uh, neurons and uh, synapses um, in a very schematized and simple manner can uh, produce this kind of uh, memory. So as shown uh, on the lower left there, um, there are places in the brain that uh, one can call a fear center that control the amount of fear that a uh, rat uh, displays. And there are nerve cells in there that we can call fear neurons. And so when those neurons uh, are active, the uh, animal shows fear. And um, normally, um, so then we can also say that there are other neurons that are coming um, from centers that uh, receive uh, auditory uh, inputs um, that would transmit uh, signals that would be activated by tone. And so that's what's shown on the upper left. Those are nerve cells that would be activated by tone. So normally the connection between these tone nerve cells and these fear neurons would be very weak. And the, that's shown by the synapses shown in that little red uh, line there. So that's a, uh, we would consider that a very weak uh, uh, synapse. And so when tone is active, normally um, it would not be sufficiently strong to activate uh, fear neurons. And so initially when you give a tone, the rat shows no fear. So in the next slide, uh, we see what happens um, if uh, we associate the tone and the shock. So here we see on the left part of that uh, diagram that uh, there are tone nerve cells uh, connected to this fear neuron. There are also nerve cells that make a very strong synapse that are activated by a shock. And uh, we know a lot about synapses. And one of the things that was fascinating and described uh, a few years ago is that the synapses in general, if uh, a strong synapse comes, is activated at the same time as a weak synapse, 
the weak synapse becomes stronger. And that's shown um, on the right part of that diagram. So the tone synapse initially was rather small, but when it was activated at the same time as the shock, because of the fact that the shock was a strong synapse and that they were active at the same time, that causes that uh, weak synapse to become uh, stronger. So that's indicated by a uh, larger red line coming from the tone uh, neuron. So now, if you expose an animal to a tone, that synapse would be strong enough to activate those fear neurons, and so now the animal will show fear. So this is a very simple uh, and simplified, but uh, we think it's uh, probably fairly accurate in, um, in the uh, schema, schema of uh, how memory is formed, at least this kind of memory. That, and you can see how synapses play a critical role both uh, the ability to strengthen synapses is important, and also the ability to maintain the strong synapse. Um, on the far right, that strong synapse has to be maintained strong in order for this memory to uh, be maintained. And so um, this is the sort of work that I've done over the last 20 years or so trying to understand all the particulars about uh, how this kind of uh, system works and how synapses participate in this. Um, and what we found uh, a few years ago, as I mentioned after discussions with uh, Sam Sisodia and Rudy Tanzi, was, um, as shown in the next slide, that um, Alzheimer's disease um, actually weakens synapses. And so the there are things that build up in the brain that uh, are produced when a person has Alzheimer's disease called uh, beta amyloid. And I'm sure that's been discussed in other parts of, uh, of this forum. Yes, indeed. And, uh, sorry? I said yes, indeed. Uh, yeah. Um, and that beta amyloid, um, actually, we, we've been able to show weakens uh, synapses. And so you can see that if that tone synapse is weakened by beta amyloid um, that effectively can uh, remove uh, the memory. It can lose the memory. Um, so that's one way that Alzheimer's um, can remove an existing memory. Um, the other thing that we know is that, uh, and shown in the next slide, is that in Alzheimer's disease, uh, the same compound beta amyloid uh, prevents the uh, strengthening of synapses, which you, I think you see uh, the strengthening of the synapse of the tone, where initially it was weak, to uh, then becoming uh, stronger. That strengthening is very important in the formation of this uh, memory. And in Alzheimer's disease, uh, beta amyloid uh, prevents uh, that kind of strengthening. And so these are two ways that we know that uh, in Alzheimer's disease um, has an impact on um, synapses and uh, therefore in the formation and the maintenance of, uh, of memories. And so our work um, that is related to Alzheimer's disease is trying to find uh, ways of preventing uh, some of these effects of Alzheimer's disease, um, either preventing the effects of beta amyloid on synapses so that um, they won't uh, weaken synapses, or preventing the effect of beta amyloid on its uh, effects on the strengthening of synapses. And we're also interested in ways in which um, nerve cells make beta amyloid and how to control and reduce the, the formation of uh, beta amyloid, which, uh, of course, is very important in Alzheimer's disease. So this is a basic outline of the uh, kinds of studies that we've done in the past, trying to understand how memory works and uh, 
and also how it is that uh, Alzheimer's disease uh, might have an impact on uh, memory. So I hope that was uh, clear, and if you have any questions on that, uh, I'd be happy to answer them. I only have about 200 questions. <laughs> uh, oh, that was very clear and, and fascinating. Um, so uh, just to talk about the normal brain for a second and to talk about synaptic strengthening, it's my understanding that um, that every time you have them, you, you uh, remember a memory, you kind of are reliving a memory, you're actually strengthening that memory. Is that right? There's actually kind of a physical improvement of that of that synapse or the synapses that are involved in that memory. Is that right? Yeah, well, there is. Uh, that's currently being investigated, and uh, there are there are data which uh, support that view, that uh, uh, recall of the memory. Um, uh, during that time, you form and strengthen the memory. So certainly when you recall the memory, uh, you're activating those synapses. Uh, we think you're activating those synapses that uh, were strengthened. And uh, by activating them again, it's certainly uh, possible that you would be strengthening them. Yes. Um, and it's and it's likely not just two neurons talking to one another, but more like a constellation, a specific memory or thought you have is kind of activating a certain constellation of neurons that are fired sure. at the same time. Is that is that a correct way to think about it? Yes, uh, this is a very simplified uh, view, but uh, you're right that uh, something as complicated as fear is uh, is activated by many neurons. Um, so there, it wouldn't be a single fear neuron. There would be many neurons, and they would be participating in different uh, functions. And uh, a memory is really an assembly. Uh, currently, we think uh, that it's an assembly of neurons being uh, formed um, through the strengthening of uh, synapses. Um, that assembly is formed, and that assembly, activity of that assembly would be a representation of the memory. Right. Uh, so in Alzheimer's disease, we have this beta amyloid, which is this kind of this junk that's being formed in the brain that is probably a part of a, a normal process for a while, but then it kind of gets out of control. The, the beta amyloid doesn't get cleared uh, at, the, at the appropriate rate, so it kind of gathers in the brain. And um, as you were saying, it's, it disrupts these synapses. Now, um, you and I spoke about this earlier, but I'll just ask the, the question again for for uh, the the viewers out there: Is it that the the beta amyloid is actually kind of interrupting the synapses, or is it that the beta amyloid is attacking the the neuron itself and weakening it, and then the neuron is not able to produce the the uh, required synapses, or is it a combination of those those two things? Well, it could be a combination, but we know. Um, from some studies that one of the first things that is affected in Alzheimer's disease, uh, and these are studies that were done on autopsies where they could look at synapses and neurons, is that um, what correlated most with the cognitive function of that person was the, fun the number of synapses, uh, not necessarily the number of neurons. And so um, one of the first things that's affected in Alzheimer's disease is um, the strength of neurons, the size of neurons, the number of, uh, sorry, the strength of synapses, the number of synapses, um, and uh, subsequently neurons do die. And so certainly without a neuron, you won't have a synapse. Um, so once you lose a neuron, as we know, unfortunately, uh, most neurons in the brain don't uh, replicate, and so once you lose a neuron, uh, it's gone, and you can't bring it back. Um, synapses, on the other hand, we know are actually quite plastic, so even though uh, they get weakened, like from Alzheimer's disease, um, we can do things that uh, recover synapses, and so that potentially uh, would be one place that uh, one could uh, provide some kind of treatment. But um, I think the target of uh, beta amyloid, there's still not a very clear idea 
um, whether it's directly on the synapse. And if you, one idea is that if you weaken a lot of synapses, they eventually go away, and a neuron without synapses um, might die because it's not getting enough growth factors from synapses. And so that's one idea um, that we're trying to test. But exactly how beta amyloid acts uh, on synapses and on neurons is a, an area of uh, of, uh, of research right now. And I, I gather the hope would be that although we, we want to prevent the formation of, of, of too much beta amyloid, we want to be able to clear it away quicker and not even get to this point, I guess I gather there's kind of another track of research that if we can't do that, maybe we can figure out what the actual harmful effects are on the synapse and we can find a way to interrupt the, that harmful process is that is that correct? The more we yeah. learn about that interaction, right, right. So this would be trying to prevent the effects of uh, beta amyloid. Um, it turns out that neurons make beta amyloid, and their activity level controls the formation of beta amyloid. This is a finding that we made uh, a number of years ago, and uh, a number of others on. Uh, on the consortium have uh, shown this also very nicely, like David de Holtzman. Um, and so we're also interested in how neurons um, make beta amyloid and what controls their uh, ability to, or the amounts that they make. And uh, we know that their activity levels um, lead to the formation of more beta amyloid. So those are two ways in which uh, one could potentially uh, have an impact on Alzheimer's disease. One would be in controlling the formation of beta amyloid, and another way would be to control the effects of beta amyloid. We also hear a lot about the, uh, the other hallmark of Alzheimer's disease, the tau tangles. Does that play directly into your research? Um, do, do the tangles have an effect, a direct effect on uh, the synapses, or do they work on a different uh, aspect of, uh, of the health of the neuron? Um, there's been some very interesting re uh, recent research on tau and synapses, and um, I don't know if uh, people have looked at the tangles themselves, but uh, they have uh, found that uh, tau is located at synapses, and it can be mobilized into synapses, and it can control uh, also the strength of synapses. And so there's a lot of very interesting active research going on now trying to understand the role that tau and uh, uh, different forms of tau that become prevalent in Alzheimer's disease, what uh, impact they would have on synapses, and also what effect uh, synapses might have on these different forms of, uh, of tau. So, yes, tau is also uh, potentially and very likely uh, playing an important role in synapses uh, right now, yes. So what is the, is, is there a big central question that, at least is there one that we haven't talked about that you are real focused on uh, in, in an, trying to answer for the, you know, for the rest of your Alzheimer's colleagues so that they can then take that piece and, 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 do something else with it. Is there kind of one central thing, or is it just more a matter of learning, you know, more and more about how about all these things uh, play out? Well, I think there's a combination. I mean, there are understanding all the details, for instance, of how uh, beta amyloid leads to the weakening um, allows us, for instance, to find uh, drug targets. And so, finding the details might uh, seem uh, mundane, but uh, it turns out to be potentially uh, very important in trying to find drugs. Um, so one of the things is really trying to understand the details of how um, beta amyloid weakens uh, synapses. And uh, we found actually that it seems that uh, beta amyloid seems to hijack some of the normal processes that occur in a nerve in neurons to, to weaken synapses. So 
Um, yes, identifying the details I think is important if we're going to try to find uh, drugs. Um, I think uh, uh, there are a number of, of big questions uh, related to just how is it that uh, the activity of nerve cells, which is controlled by presumably how much you think and how much you use your brain, um, how does that fit in to, to all this? Um, we know that in some ways uh, activity in some nerve cells actually make, makes more a beta, this bad stuff. And so some would say, well, if you use that part of the brain, maybe uh, it's bad. But uh, it's, uh, you know, the brain is pretty complicated and there's uh, a lot of different factors and uh, feedback kind of systems that are in play. And so that's another big question is really how is the, the whole circuit uh, being affected uh, by a Alzheimer's and how is it that circuit uh, activity um, controls the development, the initiation and development of, uh, of Alzheimer's. So those are some um, big questions. I think the, uh, the third one I would uh, point out is related to some of the uh, amazing work that's being done uh, by the Cure Alzheimer's Foundation where um, Rudy Tanzi, for instance, is identifying mutations in specific proteins that are associated with uh, the disease. And it turns out that many of those proteins are located at synapses. And so we're working with him to try to understand why it would be that mutations in those proteins might predispose individuals to uh, Alzheimer's disease. And so that's uh, also a, a very interesting area of trying to find out uh, the genetics of Alzheimer's and how that uh, genetics uh, plays into all of these topics that I've been talking about. So, what you think? <laughs> That's a perfect segue to my next question. You mentioned a number of, of people, uh, a number of, of collaborators that are uh, both in your lab and also across the country and the world. Um, and let's talk about the the research uh, research collaboration and and the climate of research. The um, and the role that Cure Alzheimer's Fund plays. You mentioned Rudy Tanzi. He's the chair of the this research consortium, which is a group of, of scientists who are scattered at these uh, these uh, fantastic institutions across the country. And you're a member of that consortium. You get together with your with your colleagues either by phone or physically in a room several times a year to discuss your individual research and to talk about new ways that you might attack all these questions and between the, the lot of you, you're also aware of a lot of other, uh, virtually all, I would, I would just say, uh, interesting research going on in other labs so you can kind of bring that to the conversation. And then that's really, and, th and that's really kind of a special, um, a special process that takes place and you're able to um, advance, uh, advance the ball quite a bit in, the, in that collaborative way. Is that, is that correct? Yes, I would say exactly that it's uh, important uh, to talk to people who know what's really going on because um, unfortunately publications are usually two years behind what's really going on. So uh, knowing what's uh, the, the latest research um, in these meetings with these people in the Cure Alzheimer's Foundation and this consortium is really a meeting with uh, the people who know the leading edge of all these uh, areas that are being addressed uh, related to Alzheimer's disease. And uh, so you get a lot of uh, ideas and you can mold them around. And uh, I, I, you know, I learn a lot in these discussions and uh, hopefully we can bring in um, some you know, people who can learn some from what I'm uh, um, uh, talking about. So yes, these discussions uh, I think are very uh, useful. Um, I don't know if that sound meant that uh, there's uh, something going on, but I can't hear. 
Okay, I think I've, I've, I was accidentally muted, but I think I'm unmuted now. Um, so, and just one more question about, about Cure Alzheimer's Fund and this collaborative process. There's, this is a private research foundation. Obviously, it's a, a, we're, our budget is up to about $10 million a year, which is, we're grateful for all the contributions, and we're able to put that money to, to good use. It pales in comparison to what the, the federal government can do with hundreds of millions of dollars in research. But maybe you could talk about the kinds of research that get done private, it gets done funded privately versus the kind of research that gets funded publicly, because I think we're able to uh, to take a, a little bit more of a risky approach and kind of get more out in front of, of some of these advanced ideas, whereas the public money tends to be uh, a, a little bit more like what you said with the publications, just a little bit slower and, and more conservative. Yes, absolutely. Um, unfortunately, Yes, the public money is quite conservative and you have to give a lot of preliminary data and you have to have uh, stories almost you know, pretty well along in order to get uh, funding for that. Um, whereas if you have uh, ideas that come out of these discussions, for instance, that uh, are you know, potentially things that uh, might be game changers, but uh, on the other hand, they may fall through, but uh, these exciting ideas um, are often the things that uh, that are really going to change uh, the field. And so this Cure Alzheimer's Foundation brings these people together, and then uh, when we have ideas, we can get funding for them from this cons uh, consortium um, quite quickly. Uh, quickly. We don't have to have a lot of uh, preliminary uh, data. Basically, they fund people who have a track record of doing well, of having good ideas, and uh, if you have a good idea, they will uh, tend to fund it. And so I think it's quite different from how uh, public money is uh, uh, given out, where you have to really have uh, much more uh, established kinds of uh, ideas that have a lot of uh, preliminary uh, data. So there is a, a big difference and uh, this private money has, I think as you said, uh, has uh, risk but it has high payoff. So it's, it's really great to be um, associated or part of this uh, group. Uh, so we have just a few more minutes. I'm gonna um I'm going to ask a few more questions. I'm going to re-invite our public to submit their questions on Facebook at, at uh, facebook.com slash curealzheimers. Um, let's take a few of the questions that have come in. Um, you mentioned before that you are also researching uh, depression. Is there any connection between what you've learned uh, about depression and, and, and synapses and neurons and what you've learned uh, with Alzheimer's, is, does some of the information apply to both? Is, is there a way to? I know, I know, you know, depression doesn't call, cause Alzheimer's, but maybe you're you're seeing some interesting uh, connections there on on uh, your level of study. Well, we study synapses, and uh, there are different parts of the brain that control different uh, aspects of behavior. There are some parts of the brain that control memory, and the weakening and strengthening of those synapses is very important for making memories and uh, storing memories. Um, there are other parts of the brain. Um, one part that we're studying now has been called uh, the disappointment center. And uh, basically when a person is, or an animal is disappointed, when it doesn't get a, a reward that it's expecting, this part of the brain becomes active. And it's important in guiding behavior. And we study synapses in there, and we found that in uh, situations uh, that model depression, uh, synapses get stronger there, get too strong. So whereas in Alzheimer's, um, synapses might get too weak, in uh, depression, we think that synapses might get too strong in a different part of the brain, and that, in a sense, would cause uh, persistent or excessive disappointment and that might be uh, how you uh, become depressed or would be linked to depression. 
So our the connection in, in our minds is uh, synapses and what controls uh, how synapses get stronger and uh, what controls how synapses get uh, weaker. And uh, a lot of the same kind of uh, molecules and principles that control synapse weakening and strengthening um, take place in all these different parts of the brain. So I guess that would be the level of connection that I would uh, find. We have a question um, which may seem a little general, but maybe you can relate it to your uh, work w about the average life expectancy of an Alzheimer's patient. And I guess my follow-up to that would be, um, and can you see in your research how on the synaptic level the, the disease might be slower or quicker uh, depending on how it's affecting the synapses or how the synapses are perhaps resisting, uh, resisting the disease? Yes, that's a very interesting question. I think that uh, it's been very difficult to answer, which is how, why is it that uh, the disease comes on at different ages um, and um, even though you have the same genetic background or your same genes and um, at some point in your life you start developing this and so what uh, is happening there and at the level of synapses um, what I uh, one model I have is that uh, beta amyloid, the stuff that we've been talking about that uh, is uh, bad in Alzheimer's disease, uh, potentially might have a normal function um, uh, acting on synapses, basically keeping them within some normal range. We know that, the, that the activity of neurons um, controls uh, the formation of A-beta, and A-beta controls the strength of the synapse. Um, so uh, that would be essentially a feedback loop where the more active you, uh, the neurons are, the uh, more it weakens the synapses, which would then reduce the activity. Um, what uh, I'm thinking is that uh, that process, which is normally a homeostatic or feedback, uh, negative feedback system, might at some point uh, become dysregulated so that um, either the activity is no longer controlling the formation of beta amyloid, beta amyloid just starts being made uh, regardless of the levels of activity, or um, that beta amyloid starts having more effect on, on neurons. And somehow this feedback system that initially was uh, uh, negative and homeostatic and kept everything in a normal range somehow becomes dysregulated and uh, goes out of control. And trying to understand how this normal feedback system could go out of control might give us a handle on um, how it is that uh, the disease develops. Once it develops, it kind of keeps on uh, uh, going. So. That's how I would look at it at the level of synapses, um, but it's pretty far away from um, you know, the, the patient. Um, but that's one of the ideas that I have related to that question. Great. Well, I've got two more questions, um, and uh, the, the first one is going to be about this, uh, what looks some might interpret as a piece of modern art behind you, but I think we should explain this extraordinary uh, photograph off to your right, and uh, maybe you could tell us what that is and, and why it's there. Right there, yes. Well, this is actually, uh, the big picture here is, uh, is an electron micrograph of um, the brain. So that's actually, if you make a cut into the brain, that's what it actually looks like. It's not as simple as that, those images that I showed. And... Um, um, this is actually a synapse, so that fuzzy stuff uh, right there wow. is uh, the receptive part of neurotransmitters, and those little circles up here is where the neurotransmitter is contained. And so uh, the way that synapse works is when an electrical signal comes down to this area, it causes these little 
uh, circles to fuse with the membrane and release neurotransmitter, which is then active on this uh, fuzzy stuff, and that causes an electrical signal that travels uh, down this uh, nerve cell. So this uh, you know, is, a, is a really big blow up of, uh, of the brain because uh, you wouldn't be able to put the width of a hair here. This is probably, uh, you know, uh, less than uh, one thousandth of the size of the width of a, of a hair. Wow. So this is very tiny sort of stuff and there's billions and billions of these synapses in the brain. So, of course, everything I talked about uh, was simplified in the sense that I talked about what was happening in synapses in general, but uh, turns out that each one of these can be controlled uh, visually. Um, but the general principles of how they work and how they're strengthened and weakened uh, seem to apply to, to most of these uh, synapses. So anyway, that's what they really look like. And down here, this is actually an axon, and all that black stuff is myelin. So that's uh, what makes uh, uh, the electrical signal travel. This is a cross-section of an axon, and uh, the myelin, that black stuff, uh, is what makes the signal travel down the axon very quickly. And when you have other diseases, like demyelinating diseases, like uh, multiple sclerosis, you lose this uh, black uh, covering, uh, this sheath on these axons, and so the signals don't travel uh, right. well. It's funny, because I'm used to thinking of myelin as white, and that's a black, it's a thick black uh, out of insulation, but... Uh, it depends how you... Uh, make the picture, I guess. Yeah, right. Um, so I guess the last question, and this may be unfair, but we want to. People are watching, and they want to know when Alzheimer's is going to be stopped, and what the latest is there. So let's figure out a way to somehow connect it to your research. I know you're not involved in directly in drug development, but um, what is the most exciting thing that you see uh, in terms of you know, uh, possible treatments coming down the pike, and if there's a way to connect that to your to your very specific research on, on synapses? What's, how does the landscape look to you from where you sit? Well, I, as you say, I'm not really involved in drug development, although there are some drug companies that are interested in our work. Um, I just, I think other people in the consortium um, know uh, quite a bit more than I do about this, but uh, certainly there are, uh, uh, there's a lot being understood about what's happening in Alzheimer's disease. And I think that that's what's exciting about uh, this field, that the more we know, the more uh, drug targets that we can identify. And uh, certainly there are targets that will, that are being tested now that control the formation of this uh, compound beta amyloid. And uh, I think those are coming along um, reasonably well. I don't know the details of that. Um, but uh, those, I, I think that uh, there's just a lot being learned about the molecules that uh, participate in Alzheimer's disease. And uh, every one of those molecules is a potential drug target. And so um, even though I think that we're a few years away from really uh, testing those, um, I think it's uh, it's a good it's an interesting time in the field because a lot is being understood and uh, therefore there are a lot of targets that are being uh, identified. Right. Well, um, thank you so much. That's that's all the time we have uh, today. I'm going to read a little something here. Um, thank you for watching. Thanks for your questions today. You can continue to post your questions on our Facebook page, and we can try to answer them in a variety of ways. This has been Inside the Alzheimer's Lab, which is a production of Cure Alzheimer's Fund, a not-for-profit dedicated to supporting the research that will stop this terrible disease. Every dollar you donate to Cure Alzheimer's Fund goes directly to scientific research. Its founders cover all administrative costs. So every dollar, every penny, in fact, will, that you donate will go directly to, to uh, and completely to, um, to laboratory research. The founders of Cure Alzheimer's Fund are Jeff Morby, Jackie Morby, Henry McCants, and Phyllis Rappaport. 
Thanks again to our guest, Dr. Roberto Malino. I'm David Shank, and thank you so much for listening and for joining us today. Thank you.